Hello everybody, welcome back to Exponential Finance, the podcast covering finance, technology and innovation, from our home in Japan and beyond. Today's episode features a look at the intersection of Japanese history and finance. In his monograph The Money Doctors from Japan, Michael Schiltz explores how money and finance have been among the most potent tools of colonial power. His study investigates the Japanese experiment with financial imperialism, or yen diplomacy at several key moments between the acquisition of Taiwan in 1895 and the outbreak of the Sino-Japanese War in 1937. Through authoritarian monetary reforms and lending schemes, government officials and financial middlemen served as money doctors who steered capital and expertise to Japanese official and semi-official colonies in Taiwan, Korea, China, and Manchuria. This book has been published by Harvard University Press. And now, please welcome Michael Schildes, Associate Professor for the Modern Japanese Studies Program at the University of Hokkaido. Hello, Michael. Welcome to the podcast. So you're really in a very interesting spot, and it's a very different podcast today than most of the ones where we're looking at the latest technology. So we're taking a look back into history. If I think about this as a Venn diagram, and we have finance, and we have Japan, and we've got history, you're in the center of all of this. How did you get into the middle of these three very interesting domains? Let me first thank you for today's talk. And indeed, like you say, we're not going to be talking the latest technologies. We're actually going to be talking probably closest to the earliest technologies, at least earliest modern ones or something. So the way I got into this was a bit by accident when I was working as a postdoctoral assistant at the University of Leuven. And I started looking into the history of the Bank of Japan when I found out that the Bank of Japan was actually modeled at the time after the National Bank of Belgium. There were a host of reasons for that. Actually, the Japanese went to France first. And there, they were advised to look at the Belgian example, I think for a few reasons. Traditionally, Japanese historians refer to the uh, more advanced state of the National Bank of Belgium. I personally like to think that it is mostly because of, well, within Europe, Belgium as a peripheral or as a smaller nation, right? And so there was a little bit of fintech there as well. The Belgians were among the first to experiment with a foreign exchange in their national banks and open market operations and so on. Other ones were the Austria-Hungarians, you see, again, a peripheral nation. So it was necessity as the mother of invention, you know, and that's why the Japanese went with that. I found it nice to write about that. I mean, that paper is like 12 years now or something. But I found that within Japanese history, finance, although it occupies an arguably important role, was still relatively understudied. And I suppose that technicalities of finance are definitely uh, an explanation for that. It was my way of carving out a niche, so to say. So you came from the history side and the focus on Japan, and then the finance side was the last decision. Absolutely, yeah. So many people will be familiar with the common history of Japan having been closed for two and a half centuries. Commandant Perry came, opened up the country. And what does it mean for an economy, financial system that has been closed for such a long time, yeah. is suddenly being forced open? That's a very apt question, actually. Because finance is very much at the heart of everything that happens after the opening up of the country. So what had happened in the world while Japan was some kind of a social cultural Galapagos island, you find a world that has already largely been internationalized. And interestingly, you end up in a world in which the gold-silver parity had already been settled. So basically the idea was that for one unit of gold, that was exchangeable for 14 units of silver. But in the Japanese economy, that was completely not the case. So what the Japanese had done during the uh, Sakoku period, or the period of closure, was developing something very close to a fiat money system, in which there was a gold standard for Edo, for Tokyo, and silver currency actually circulated a subsidiary coinage. So this was basically, these were banknotes printed on silver. But interestingly, silver was very overvalued in the Japanese economy. And so what happened to us that merchants come into the country and as soon as there is a treaty in which silver and gold can be exchanged weight by weight, they bring in their outside silver, exchange it for Japanese silver, exchange that Japanese silver for gold, ship out the gold, and of course, repeat the exchange cycle. And so what happens is that in a very short period of time, Japan lost very, very large gold reserves. So it completely upset the economy. There are very beautiful prints about people looking at their currencies, really baffled that their wealth from before has suddenly turned into nothing. 
This explains largely, I believe, the major restoration. So a financial crisis that triggers reform within the country. In your book, you describe the banks that came into Yokohama, which was the destinated entry point for traders. One can probably trace the lineage of many of the banks, but the one name that still sounds familiar today is the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, HSBC. Oh. That name is still there, and what you describe as classic arbitrage exists today as well. So some of the things in history and financial history still are very much like they were 150 years ago. Oh, yeah. It's actually the story I very much like as well. Like if you look at the history of finance, of course, I mean, there's a lot of things that have become very complicated. But in the end, the objectives and some of the very technologies, they still came, I mean, remain the same, right? And what happened with HSBC ending up in Yokohama, this was a process that already started much earlier in China, obviously, in the immediate aftermath of the opium war. Most of China, most of Eastern Asia, actually, is run over by a tsunami of foreign institutions. Some of them do not exist anymore. A name that doesn't ring any bell now anymore, but was a very, very, very large institution was the Oriental Bank Corporation. This went bankrupt in the 1880s, but indeed there are a few other ones that survived the crisis remarkably well. And indeed HSBC, I love working on the history of that bank, is still there. Standard Chartered, another one. I don't think it's that very prominent in East Asia, but I think it's very prominent in South Asia. And so these are there as well. We had the opening and the gold is flowing out through the arbitrage that you described. So we've got a very sick patient, Japan. The title of your book is The Money Doctors. So at yes. some point, then the, the money doctors come in. What is a money doctor? The money doctor is a typical phenomenon of an internationalized world in which some of the players are still not yet on the standard of the key currencies of the world but they put themselves in the clothes of an advisor. Mostly there's more political sway to it, of course. And they offer this advice, offer at a very good price to the peripheral nations in order to effectuate a monetary reform. In the gold standard period, that was mostly done through a currency board. What happened is that they levered their currencies upon the key currencies of the world. And so you basically have like a pyramid of currencies in the late 19th century. Of course, the familiar ones, the British pound, the French franc, the German mark as well. These are the ones that are clearly the central currencies and the United States dollars is, is, one of, is one of the ones coming up currency, right? But the currencies in East Asia are mostly illiquid. And in order to make them more liquid, they are levered upon the, the currencies in the, in, the, in the world center. You also mentioned in the book that at that time, the Mexican peso was actually a highly valued currency. It's, it's the Mexican dollar. It's the Mexican dollar. Mexican dollar. So how did that come about? That's a very interesting story. And I don't think we know everything about that. But the Mexican dollar was not a national currency. So this was a truly transnational currency only used for settling international trade transactions. And it had been used in Asia for a very, very long time. The Chinese, of course, being merchants at heart, had used that all the time. Uh, and it was circulating in all the trading uh, ports, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Mumbai, you know, all those coastal cities what is nowadays referred to as East Asian Mediterranean. So that was this transnational currency, the Mexican dollar. But it was soon under attack by several nation states who wanted to replace that transnational currency over which they don't, didn't have any control. And they wanted to replace it with their own ones. So the story here is actually one that starts in your country, actually, in Germany, around 1870. So you probably remember that it was the Franco-Prussian War. The Germans extract a large indemnity, use the indemnity or at least want to use the indemnity to go onto the gold standard, and the French try to sabotage that. So what they do is basically torpedo the metallic system that had been, well, so France had been, let's say, the clearing ground for international gold and silver. That is a very different story. So as soon as it leaves that role, silver goes into a free fall, more or less. And that is when several countries in the world center decide that, because Asia is still using silver, let's try to create a demand for that silver. And so they push their silver reserves into East Asia, some with more success than others. The German plan actually was the first, but it was never put into, uh, into action. Let's make a German silver dollar replace the Mexican dollar, right? And then you see a whole range of other countries trying to do something similar. The British put the Hong Kong dollar into circulation and so on. And the Japanese tried to do that with their Japanese silver trade dollar, which is also a disaster. I mean, again, it's very much bound up with the history of silver and, and the fall of silver in the period. So how did Japan wrestle back control over their own currency? 
Yes, well, that's a bit the central question of the book, isn't it? The answer is difficult to that. There is a bit of search theoretical literature in, in economics about how an international monetary order is achieved. And it's mostly network effects. Before 1900, or let's say mostly up to 1914, it's clear that British pound is the world's currency. Or you could even say the bill on London, to put it into trade terms. That's the world's currency. And it's not so much because the British push that currency. No, it's actually it's more because the others buy into the British pound's liquidity and they establish their institutions in the, in the heart of the city of London and so on. And so it's very much a process of others buying into your thing. So it's not something that you can push. But it, that also doesn't mean that the equilibrium never changes. It takes mostly something what in systems theory is called a catastrophe to do that. And the catastrophe that did it for British pound clearly was World War I when the city of London concentrates on the theater of war in Europe and is replaced at the time, more or less, by the US, the United States dollar. Now, it's not because you cannot push your currency that you cannot try. And that's the story, actually, I think, behind the book. So there was an awareness within Japan's policy circles that there existed something like an international monetary pyramid, and it wanted to boost the role of the Japanese yen within the pyramid. And what you see in the book is a whole lot of experiments trying to push the yen as a vehicle currency. That's the story of the book in short. And in this pyramid at the time, the top level was ultimately a gold pack currency. Yes, so, yes. Yeah. And so the ambition of the Japanese and was to join the club of gold currency countries, basically. Absolutely, absolutely. And push this out further. And the book is structured in four phases, also with the underlying thesis that financial history or finance doesn't stand by itself. It's always tied into a political context, yeah. also is tightly bound into the Japanese history of expansion, imperialism, and so on. So it starts with Taiwan, goes to Korea, China, and then Manchukuo. Let's start in the order of the book. What happened in Taiwan? Before we do that, let me just say that the Japanese did not just invent this kind of policies. So what they see is a world that has already been conquered by several countries, and they just want their piece of the pie. With the difference that because they're a latecomer, the tactics they use are so aggressive. And so uh, monetary reform goes hand in hand with the flag, goes hand in hand with military conquest. In the case of Taiwan, the incorporation of Taiwan within the Japanese empire, the financial story of that never had been told. So you see that this is an island that nobody basically wanted. And there was a foreign general who had told the Japanese, you know, why don't you just take Taiwan, right? Nobody seems to want it. And so they did that. But in the beginning, they realized it's a very costly thing. There is an uprising by the indigenous tribes and so on. Suppression of that uh, is very bloody. And so it becomes in the beginning a problem for Japanese policymakers. But because of the, the colonial ideology, they still want to bring it into the Japanese monetary orbit. And so they force it onto what they call a gold standard, but it's not so much a gold standard. This is a standard levered upon the Japanese yen. And from a research perspective, you said the sources are quite scarce around this. So how do you reconstruct his history in that case? For the history of Taiwan, I was fortunate that there was a history of the Bank of Taiwan to start with. The other thing is that the monetary advisor at the time is actually a, a rather famous guy in Japanese history. His name is Goto Shinpei. Well, he was many things. You know, he was a doctor. He was uh, clearly a, an imperialist and with a very strong character. I think he is the mascot of the Japanese Boy Scouts as well. So he's like a, a very influential figure. And the other thing that I was happy to find was that the Japanese had developed a financial journalism along the lines of the British. And so there was something called, well, the Japanese version of the Bankers, the Bankers Journal, which I could use and, uh, to reconstruct some of the debates and, and so on. And so along this timeline, when did the Bank of Japan actually get founded? The Bank of Japan is a construct from the 1880s. So that was then 15, 20 years before the Taiwan story started? Yes, exactly. You should see this in the aftermath of the financial crisis in the early Meiji period, struggling to catch up with the West and see you know, what, what are the institutions that you need. So there is another bank, which is the Yokohama Specie Bank, but the Bank of Japan is established shortly, uh, shortly after that in order to bring not so much Japan on the gold standard because it was on the silver standard at the time, but at least to bring some, uh, some monetary order to the country. So if you're looking at Taiwan, the money doctors, do they come out of the Bank of Japan or the wider sphere of the Bank of Japan or the economic figures? 
Uh, not so much. The Bank of Japan is uh, mostly Japan-centered, and if anything, uh, they would come from the cater of, of the Yokohama SPC Bank, but mostly these are people uh, coming from other banks, entrepreneurs. Taiwan is a little bit an exception either because I suppose because it's so early, but you see it especially in the case of Korea, like where is the, the so-called first bank in Japan, which becomes the National Bank of Korea. From a colonial perspective and, and hierarchy among the nations, the Bank of Taiwan would then be subordinated to the Bank of Japan from a structure perspective? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So what you see there is that in the case of Japan proper, this is even there, it's arguably not a complete gold standard because they lever their, so the gold reserve for Japanese paper currency is actually held at the Bank of England in the very beginning. But in the case of the Bank of Taiwan, it's more interesting because again, you see this pyramid-like thing, whereas this time the money of Taiwan is levered upon, not, not certainly not on gold, but on currency board expressed in Japanese yen. So the Japanese yen there, or amounts of Japanese yen, are used as the currency reserve for Bank of Taiwan notes. So in the same way that the Bank of England got essentially free deposits of foreign money in the form of gold, the Bank of Japan got interest-free deposits from the colonial countries because they had to have to hold the reserves there. Yes, but of course, with the one difference that, at least in the English case, there is real gold backing the currency. Whereas uh, what happens if you go to the more to the periphery of Japan, you know, so the, to the periphery of the periphery, so to speak, it becomes a, a paper, a paper tiger or paper pyramid. So if you refer to this currency imperialism, and if you transfer it into what we have today, where we have this dominance of the US dollar, Would you call it the U.S. dollar imperialism or is it more dominance, hegemony? And where do you draw the difference between those? I think the difference is when there is also active political will and action to force. Well, it's not, not, not so much to force. Well, I, I, I do not doubt that we are still living in a period of what you could call the U.S. dollar standard. The dollar standard, well, the dollar has been challenged, certainly by the euro a little bit. But if, if you still look at, at the composition of foreign banks, foreign exchange holdings, then you'd see that there is a standing role for the US dollar for whatever reason. I think currency imperialism becomes a thing as soon as certain countries start to aggressively push their currencies. It's, for instance, not so easy to say whether China is doing the same thing. It's clear that China is challenging US dollar monopolism or monopoly. You know, they're trying to float UN denominated bonds and those kind of things. It also is to see what actions of China in Africa are going to turn out to. Uh, but in the Japanese case, I mean, so going back in history, that was clearly in, in currency imperialism. That's, yes. It's uh, forcing people to accept your more or less illiquid currency and make it liquid by force. Understood. Thank you. And so what did Japan learn from the Taiwan experience and did differently and better when it came to Korea? Well, Taiwan was, at least in the beginning, a pretty much of a drain on Japanese coffers, right? So there was even talk of selling the island to France, which did not happen. They kept it and they experimented with their very peculiar gold standard. But what happens in Korea, of course, is that it, Korea is of a larger strategic importance. So this is something that they did not want to give up. It had been described by a German general, I believe, that Korea was like a dagger pointing at the heart of Japan. So they did not want to lose this. And in the Korean case, it was also not really much of a question of incorporating Korea in the Japanese economy, at least not in the very beginning. So this only becomes a question in the 1930s, when Korea becomes some kind of hotbed for experimental Japanese industries, very large industries. But in the beginning, that's not the case. Korea has a constant deficit with Japan proper. And so it's, it's another drain. But again, it's something that the Japanese, they find it affordable because it's of such, such strategic importance. And if you think about it, of course, we have the benefit of the hindsight. And that's why we tend to see this lineage towards the Second World War. But it's not that clear cut. It's a road full of experimentation and a lot of failure, to be honest. So what are some of the examples of what they tried out and maybe the things that didn't work that well? Well, the monetary firm in itself was a pretty much of a disaster uh, for a host of reasons. And the most important explanation for that is are a host of factors that are beyond Japanese control. For instance, the price of certain metals. To give a concrete example, the price of copper had become pretty much of a liability for the Japanese. The Korean economy was still largely on copper currency. And as soon as the copper becomes too expensive, 
you can imagine what happens, right? Then it takes copper out of circulation, it drags the country in a deflationary spiral, and because of the mistrust of the Japanese by the Koreans, they do not want to accept Japanese currency. So you have a very, very period full of turmoil and, and turbulence, um, especially in between 1905 and 1910. It's the period as well. You know, the, the Japanese were pretty late in the imperial game. And they entered the imperial game at a time when notions like sovereignty had been invented. So this, I mean, at least in international law. This is the period in which the United States, again, also a latecomer, but a smarter latecomer, so to speak, uh, calls for the open door and equal opportunities for all the colonizers in China. And it experiments with this, with this corpus of, of international law. And so these ideas become very important. The Koreans realize that and they will uh, try and protest their occupation by the Japanese using the vocabulary of international law. So it's a very complex story there. Honestly, this was also the story that was the most difficult for me to reconstruct. Because of the complexity or because of... Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. There are so many things going on there. So many things that go wrong as well. I never worked for a central bank, but if you work for a large central bank, I think there is, you know, you realize that the world is so messy that you have to work with sometimes dirty, well, it's not so much dirty, but fast and fast tricks. And, you know, you have to be able to improvise. So then all moved to China, which, as you said, through the open door policy became a bit of a battleground for all the imperialistic powers. And how did Japan handle that? In the end, China is, of course, you know, that's the big fish. Japan was, even their colonies, they were having constant, the colonies had constant deficits with Japan. But this is obviously different for China. This was a, the trading hub, I mean, for the, the large part of the whole, re, for the history of the whole region for a long time, right? Chinese merchants had settled already in many of the ports, including in Japan. In Kobe, for instance, there was a very large Chinese merchant settlement. And so this is the kind of fish that you want to have. What the Japanese had not realized was that the rhetoric of the open door was so strong. Even if the United States, of course, had its own agenda, it just makes more sense to talk about equal chances for everybody. And there is this administration during the Second World War, you know, when Japan sees a chance to push its own interest in China. There is this administration. First, they try to, uh, this is called the 21 Demands. It's enough to gain concrete and real influence, but it's, it's rebuffed by the Americans. And Japan becomes a member of an international banking consortium that will lend to China. But in the consecutive administration, this Japanese participation within the consortium becomes contested. And so you, there is the unilateral development of a push into China. This is the famous, well, not so much known anymore, but within China's Chinese historians definitely remember it. Um, these are the Nishihara loans. And the aim is to lend to China in a very aggressive way. Well, you could compare it, I think, to a lot of Chinese action in, in Africa these days, right? A lot of investment in heavy industry, in infrastructure. But of course, this is the, it's a way to tie the hands of the receptor. The way you described it is very similar to contemporary history as well, where the Nishihara loans were approved on the last day of the legislative period, <laughs> just Absolutely. before the parliament closed, so that everybody was kept in the dark and was a bit under underhanded, maybe. But these loans didn't turn out that well. No. Absolutely not. They were very, very bad received. The loans most probably went to line the pockets of corrupt Chinese officials, if only because there was no unified China at the time, right? This is the period of the warlords. And one of them simply used the money, probably I, I suppose, to finance his own campaign within China. I mean, nothing of the infrastructure that was planned was ever realized. And because of the international, you know, there was such a brazen thing of the Japanese to do, it's forced to write off all these loans. This is a bit of a this is a bit of the drama of the Japanese Empire at the time. All the foreign reserves, all the gold reserves that accumulated during World War One, because it could fill the vacuum that the European powers had left. So the United States and the Japanese and the United States and Japan were the two big victors of World War One. But Japan unfortunately loses all the money. So first of all, by dumping all the money into loans into China, but as you know, they also lend to Tsarist Russia. And of course, once the revolution breaks out, these loans are not considered fit for repayment. So uh, they lose that as well. 
How did Japan recover? And then, of course, very soon afterwards, we get the Wall Street crash of 29. And yes. uh, yeah. so just, just a sequence of bad financial experiences. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really a, a roller coaster of bad news because very soon after World War I, we have the, you know, the big Tokyo earthquake, which is uh, massive, which is massively expensive. And in Japan or Tokyo, the Tokyo government allows banks to carry over those loans and bad loans from within the war using so-called earthquake bonds and so these things accumulate so there's a, an enormous debt bubble which explodes only a few years before the wall street crash so we're talking 1927 so japan is experiencing this one you know it's a bit like japan experiencing the bursting of the bubble before 2008 so japan had you know had this first this first experience with depression already in 27 but then of course it is only compounded by 29 and it's a very complicated period. I, to be very honest with you, I also do not understand a lot of the economics, what's going on in the 30s. Uh, it's very, very complicated. The final chapter goes into Manchukuo, which was then the puppet state. It seems obvious that you can push your money into that, but also you were saying that from the late 1900s, this was the age of imperialism and Japan wanting to become part of this group of first-tier countries. And there was no doubt that they had to expand to be part of that. But there was also still lots of internal debate about the method of how to go about this. So that was not a foregone conclusion. The direction was clear, the method not necessarily. So can you also talk a bit about what happened internally in Japan and the different factions? Manchuria is an interesting case. And again, being historians, you know, we have the benefit of the hindsight. And so it looks... And it certainly, there is a logical reason for Japan to expand into Manchuria, if only because of the deficits the other countries were having with, that the other colonies were constantly running with Japan. So this was different from Manchuria, which was a bit of an industrial hub. And so very much like India in the British setup, Manchuria became the place where Japan was running its own deficits with Manchuria. And so in order to make everything go smooth, there is a, a logical, uh, logical role to Manchuria, so to speak. But indeed, within Japan, it was far from settled. The question mostly is about, you know, how do we bring Manchuria in our monetary orbit? Do we do it on gold? Because after all, we are a gold standard country. Or do we play with the realities of the location of Manchuria? And so why don't we leave it on silver? This becomes also a very, very complicated process with, I tend to believe it's rather rather Japanese, with factions warring with other factions. And so there is the gold faction, which is led by the Bank of Korea, and there is the silver faction, which is mostly led by the Yokohama PC Bank. In the end, for what and for what of reason was, re was left, the reasonable faction, this means the pragmatic faction, won. China never went, and no, not even one part of China never really went on a gold standard would have just been impossible to lift it up to that and, and do the conversion? Well, the Japanese were mostly afraid of speculative attacks against those currencies. And they uh, realized that in order to bring Manchuria on a gold standard currency, they would have to have real gold reserves and also being willing to lose parts of them in order to sustain a gold standard for that vast land over there. When you look at this whole history and how the Japanese system evolved with the roller coaster ups and downs, frequent crises, how would you think this has still shaped until today how Japanese think about central banking currencies and the whole hatching arbitrage kind of opportunities? I think the key element there is, of course, the realization by the Americans that a lot of the Japanese talk about the yen as a key currency it was a lot of fluff. And so what would happen in 1941 was the financial freeze by the United States. And this was basically declaring the country bankrupt, uh, declaring that the yen could not be used as a vehicle for international trade transactions. So this changes everything. The disaster of the World War II that followed is the uh, immediate result of the latter. For Japan, of course, World War II was disastrous, right? It comes out of World War II completely devastated. Several cities bombed heavily. I mean, Tokyo bombed by night raids. Nagasaki and Hiroshima bombed nuclearly. The threat of the Russian invasion and so on. But what happens in the aftermath of World War II is that Japan becomes the recipient of its own recipes. So it becomes itself on the receiving end of a money doctor. And the money doctor this time is from America. What happens then is that Japan 
or the Japanese yen becomes part in the, uh, well, it's something very similar to the monetary pyramid we were talking about before. Whereas the monetary pyramid was formerly headed by the British pound, now the pyramid is led by the, by the United States dollar. And Japan becomes an important part in propping up the role of the dollar in the, in the Indian national system. And it still is today, I think. And in a way, probably benefited from it as well, being packed for a considerable amount of time to a gold standard and developing probably much faster than the currency adjustments were made. They were essentially working with an undervalued currency for a long period of time, right? Yes, yes. And also, there was a very, like, you could almost consider some kind of, some kind of wartime monetary measures in a period of peace. Um, because they worked with a very complicated system. I, I wrote about it, but I forgot most of it, to be honest, of import and export controls. And um, this was uh, basically, you know, boosting the Japanese economy as a, as a buffer against communism. But it was really pretty, I mean, you can compare this to almost like a wartime economy, I think. And so obviously the yen nowadays is fully convertible and you touch upon the Chinese renminbi earlier a bit, which isn't fully convertible yet, although the government has taken steps over the last 10 years, I would say, to make progress in, in that regard. And the spread between like an onshore and an offshore currency has shrunk quite a bit. If you apply your knowledge of history and take out the crystal ball a bit, where do you think we'll end up on the internationalization of the renminbi or yuan? I'm tended to ask that, that I'm not into predictions. I think it's too complicated, especially because it's not clear to me whether China has wisely decided upon this policy of one belt, one road. In my view, quite close or quite similar to heavy-handed Japanese monetary tactics in 1920s and 30s. The role China is playing, especially, for instance, in the Bosporus. Again, all strategic places, right? Turkey, the role of infrastructure there, uh, the role of... The, and, it's, it, and a lot of it is opaque, right? Like, I, I don't even know the denominations of the loans that we're talking about. Is it NNB? I, I don't know. No. At the same time, it is clear that several international players, and we've talked about HSBC before, um, HSBC has been an underwriter for some of Chinese loans, I believe. I guess they will, they will also need that. If there is going to be a major role for the renminbi, it will have to incorporate actions in New York and London, I would guess, and maybe even Tokyo. I mean, you need the depth of capital markets and especially fixed income debt instruments where Europe, as much as we like the ECB to talk about internationalizing the euro as well, but there isn't any significant amount of paper being issued in euro until they maybe come up with their 750 billion rescue fund. But even that is probably just taken up by the emergency measures by the ECB itself. So it, by default, it's almost the only market with any debt or foreign currency reserve is the US dollar. The other thing that I think we, we uh, that is difficult to quantify, but we should not lose sight of is, of course, also um, the soft fact, the soft factor, right? Like the, and if you look at the, uh, the impact and I was honestly a bit surprised about that as well, um, upon, of, of the latest Hong Kong uh, security law, debates about whether financial institutions are thinking about relocating. You know, that's clearly not about just depth of the market. It's really about something like a value system, so to speak. In Tokyo itself, there was, I'm very sure you know, there was a, a lot of talk about, you know, how this could play out for it to the good of, for the benefit of Tokyo. Yeah, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government has actually opened an office in Hong Kong to help asset manager and fintech companies to relocate if they are so desired. Oh, did they? I, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, so they realized that there is something of a, of a soft factor in it that, that cannot be quantified, but that nevertheless plays a role, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I also, I also like remember, this is also, again, something not quantifiable, but the discussion of, about post-Brexit, when banks would relocate. What are the cities like? Would they all they think about the quality of life in those cities and so on? It definitely plays a role. Well, it's interesting how we started this conversation where you said that the Japanese came to Belgium to take a look at the central bank. Given that it was a bit smaller at the time, it was more able to experiment. And now if you look at what is called central bank digital currency, CBCs today, Sweden, for example, which 
is leading the pack. And so it's a smaller country that has the ability to drive this a little bit faster and, and manage the risk, limit the risk a bit better, probably. Yeah. So I think that's where history repeats itself. It's interesting to see, though, how nowadays central banks are jumping on the bandwagon of what was basically a certainly non-government induced you know, money creation, right? I think they're all afraid that they lose control over their payment system or going back to the pre-federal reserve system where every local regional bank issues their own currency, basically. And oh, okay, okay. But not that, well, that's interesting because there is great history of um, bills of exchange as well, right? And so this is something completely comparable, I would say, to its commercial paper. Again, we'll, we'll have to see where that's going. I find it very fascinating. Super good. This covered basically your first book. And so before we close, maybe you give us a tiny preview into the second book that just came out internationally and will be available in Japan before the end of the year. Yeah, well, thanks for that. Um, so again, we'll talk about that, uh, I don't know, one of, the f- one of the following weeks. The book debunks a myth within the financial history. Well, it's a very small club of people, of course. Um, it, in the financial history uh, club of people who thought that hedging actually did not exist in the 19th century. I got the idea that something like it had to exist because of the f- of the success of certain banks, HSBC, Standard Chartered, during the fall of silver. So you can imagine if you're a bank that is into the business of financing trade, volatility in the gold-silver parity is basically bad news. It can be a way, of course, of making money, that's for sure. But it was also bad news as the fall of the Oriental Bank and many other institutions testify of. And so my idea was don't we expect anything like hedging strategies to develop? And what I found, and that's what we're going to talk about next time, is that it was a two-pronged system, a two-pronged way. So first of all, there is development of new financial technologies. And on the other hand, some people within the HSBC cater developed the idea of hedging, of hedging currency risk. That's basically the short idea. Cool. Looking forward to that. And thanks. Watch watch out for that episode in in a few weeks' time. So for, for now, thank you for this conversation. Uh, it was great. Yeah. Super, super interesting to get a view into the early days of the, the Japanese financial system. So thank you for that. It's great. I thank you.